first of all, thanks everyone for joining today. I really appreciate it. And good evening. Uh, my name is Zach Moscato. I lead sustainability efforts for Plastic Ingenuity. And uh, you know, thank you so much for attending this webinar today. Also, thank you to the Chicago IOPP chapter for my, inviting me to present to you all today. So with that, let's dive right in. So first, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself. So I've been in the packaging industry for almost 20 years. Uh, I graduated from the University of Illinois with a mechanical engineering degree. And my first venture into packaging was a product development role with Berry Plastics in the Chicagoland area down in Elsip, Illinois. And that was really my first experience supporting big brands and retailers with their packaging development projects. And I was, I was hooked from there. I, I then transitioned to an engineering management role with a company named Poly One or Spartech located in St. Louis. I started with Plastic Ingenuity in a commercial role about six years ago, and then transitioned into our sustainability leadership role when we established the organization last year in 2021. Uh, on a personal level, I'm a dad of, of two girls, Madeline and, and Leah, and you can see them there in the picture on the left, uh, along with my better half, Emily. And that's a picture from our most recent trip to Door County up in Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin. Something to know about our family, we really love being in nature, whether it's hiking, fishing, being on a beach, swimming in a lake. You know, people ask me all the time, how do I square working in, in, in packaging, specifically for a plastics company, and being someone that loves nature? Those two, how do they, how do they go hand in hand? And maybe you've wondered the same thing. Well, simply put, the packaging that we create as an industry provides immense utility and benefits for society um, that we take for granted, frankly. And yes, there are many opportunities for improvement, but let's not lose sight of those benefits that packaging offers either. So that's where I'm gonna focus the presentation today. Let's start by level setting on what we mean when we say sustainable, I'm sorry, sustainability or sustainable. Uh, this is a quote from a sustainability discovery session we conducted last year with leading stakeholders in the packaging industry. Um, we'll see other quotes like this in the presentation. I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to read this one. It's, it's one of my favorites. So sustainability is too broad of a term. The focus is on circularity and keeping packaging out of landfills. So when you hear the term sustainability, what does that mean to you? Frankly, sustainability is an ambiguous term. If you ask 10 people what it means, you will probably get 10 different answers. Bottom line, when discussing sustainability with your value chain partners and other members of your organization, it's important to make sure that your definitions are aligned and you are on the same page. Let's start at a high level and work our way down to what it means for, for the packaging industry. So the United Nations definition of sustainability is a great place to start. I love it because it's more people centric. According to the UN, sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. They created the sustainable de development goals to provide a framework for organizations and governments to follow to ensure the development of new goods and services are as sustainable as possible. This is a holistic, people-centered approach with categories ranging from no poverty to peace and justice and every, everything in between. When you think about it, packaging touches many of these goals. However, there are two in particular that stand out to me, no hunger, and good health. The packaging we create as, as an industry, as packaging professionals, uh, provides society with many benefits, from the pres per preserving the food we serve our families at night to protecting the medical devices and medicines that we trust to save lives. So our packaging literally touches billions of lives on a daily basis. It's something to be proud of. One very critical contribution of packaging I'd like to spotlight is the role that packaging play, plays in preventing and reducing food waste. 
So most people are surprised to learn that one third of the food we grow globally gets wasted. It's thrown out, goes to a landfill, uh, doesn't serve its intended use, which is to be consumed by, by a human. Most of the waste occurs after it has left food processing facilities for consumers, so either in homes or restaurants. It's estimated that food waste accounts for 8%, 8% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions. And it's those greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to our changing climate. The good news for packaging is that it can play an integral role in preventing food loss. Uh, from barrier properties that extend shelf life to portion control and smart labeling, we have an opportunity as packaging professionals to help solve this issue. Uh, this attached chart from Ameri AmeriPen shows that the carbon footprint of a food product often vastly exceeds the carbon footprint of the packaging. One example there is ham at the top. So that says that it would take 624 packages to be equivalent to just one serving of the ham product itself. So small enhancements to the packaging can make a very big difference. But let's re revisit the UN Sustainable Development Goals to, to frame the primary challenge we are facing as a packaging industry, responsible consumption. Too much packaging of all formats and material types ends up in landfills, is incinerated, or even worse, leaches into our environments every day. It is our responsibility to improve end-of-life outcomes for all packaging types and formats so that we can shift to a circular packaging system that keeps materials in use and minimizes waste. We're going to talk about how we can do that together uh, later in this presentation. First, let's talk about drivers of change. So what, what, is, what is driving things forward? Well, a confluence of forces is accelerating change. Some of the key ones here are listed on, on the slide in no particular order. The proportion of sustainability-minded consumers is growing, especially among young, younger cohorts. This is driving brands and OEMs to reevaluate the sustainability of the goods and services they market. NGOs are helping to catalyze change through voluntary corporate commitments to sustainability frameworks. None of them is more influential than the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And one factor that may not get enough attention is the influence of the investment community. Capital investors are placing a higher weight on corporate responsibility when evaluating potential investments to ensure those companies will thrive in the long term as the ecosystem grows more sustainable. Another key driver is the leverage of buying power from large retailers and group purchasing organizations using levers such as environmentally preferred purchasing procedures to place higher value on sustainable items. Last but not least, legislative policy and regulation is driving change, which is seen in this next slide. State and federal policymakers are enacting policies aimed directly at packaging at unprecedented levels. And here are just some examples here, and, and this slide is, is not completely up to date, but you get the picture. Um, now we now have four extended producer responsibility laws in the United States. And essentially what those do is shift the responsibility uh, for waste management from the local communities to uh, to to producers such as the brands and, and packaging suppliers. Intelligently crafted science-driven policy that helps break down barriers can enable change, but we, we can't depend on government intervention to solve our problems either. So we need to take action together as an industry to improve end-of-life outcomes for all packaging types so we can continue to reap the many benefits that they offer. So now that we've discussed what sustainability means and what's driving the need for change, let's talk about the current landscape and challenges we face as an industry. As I mentioned earlier, we at Plastic Ingenuity spent last year listening to the sustainability needs of brand owners, retailers, and, and other key stakeholders, and we asked them to share 
key sustainability goals that their organizations are working towards. The results are shown here in descending order in this chart. It should be no surprise that actions related to shifting to a circular economy rank high on the list of priorities. In fact, 80% of the organizations we interviewed are actively working on maximizing the amount of post-consumer recycled material, known as PCR, in their packaging. Goals, fo goals focused on improving the recyclability of packaging were also prevalent. I would also like to point out the, the focus on minimizing food waste, given the role that we just discussed packaging plays with preservation. And we need more circular packaging outcomes, and we're going to talk about ways that we can do that. But we can't have a negative impact on food waste or greenhouse gas generation. So keep that in mind. When we say circularity or circular economy, what does that mean exactly? Again, it is important to make sure that our definitions are aligned so that we can work from a common understanding. A circular economy is a model of production and consumption that reuses, refurbishes, and recycles existing materials and products to keep them in use for as long as possible. This graphic from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation illustrates how shifting to a circular system is critical to optimizing resources and minimizing waste. So let's talk about how this circular system applies to packaging. We're all probably familiar with the three R's. Uh, this has been uh, something that's been drilled in our heads, I think, since elementary school, if you're like me. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, this is known as the waste hierarchy. Although the concept is not new, the waste hier hierarchy is a useful framework we can use to guide our journey towards a circular economy for packaging. We're going to take a deep dive now into each of these three R's. So reduce, optimizing the design. A good waste reduction strategy starts with design. Simply put, we need to optimize the efficiency of our designs from the beginning by starting with the end in mind. Over-engineering is no longer acceptable. So we need to leverage the collective design expertise of our value chains to solve problems. And, and this slide here highlights some design tactics packaging professionals can deploy when designing a new package. I'm not going to go through them all the key message here is let's use design to uh, optimize our, our packaging before they hit the market and minimize waste from, from that standpoint. I, I think, you know, we all know this feeling. We're, we're walking that tightrope and, and balancing performance requirements with the need to minimize materials and waste can be a real challenge. I have one suggestion to help navigate this tightrope walk. Uh, we can parallel path the development of multiple solutions when we're developing a new package when time and budget allows. So test and develop a solution that you have a high confidence level will work, and then test a more aggressive solution that may be pushing the limits a little bit. And maybe you're not sure it works, maybe you're not sure it gives you the performance you need, uh, but it has some attributes from a lightweighting standpoint or other other lever that would move the needle from a sustainability perspective. Find out where that true failure point is and then build in a minimal minimal factor of safety from there. The concept of reduction also applies to the carbon footprint of the package we create. So we must minimize the greenhouse gas emissions of our packaging systems. And this recent study from the Imperial College of London found that plastic and liquid fiberboard are preferable choices for beverage containers, which were studied in this life cycle analysis, based on carbon footprint. So in this chart, lower is better. You want to be lower rather than higher. Um, so if you look at the chart, in fact, the carbon footprint of aluminum and glass in this case is nearly four times higher than plastic and, and liquid fiberboard. So life cycle assessments like these can be very useful tool, especially when you're looking at different materials and you're able to compare 
apples to apples, but changing the parameters that you want to look at and control for those that, that are set. Next on the waste hierarchy is reuse. So there's some really, really exciting things happening in the world of reusable packaging for consumer applications. So I've shown a couple here, the Next Gen Cup Drink Cup Consortium and Loop, to name a few. Uh, you know, there are, the key thing is here, there are some key considerations to take into account when evaluating if a reusable option is best for your application. This includes infrastructure needed. So how will you collect the item from consumers? How will it be cleaned and sanitized? And how's it gonna get returned to the manufacturer for filling and further use? How many return cycles do you expect to get uh, or need for the reusable packaging to make sense from, from an ROI perspective and from an environmental perspective? So the number of cycles you expect to use has some really important ramifications on material selection and the design integrity that, that you're gonna need. So for example, if you expect an 80% return rate, that's really high. Uh, however, it only means that you get five uses out of a package before it is lost as waste. So if you're gonna get five uses out of a package, you sh we shouldn't be designing it for a thousand. Uh, so we need to look at these reusable systems holistically uh, to make sure we're creating a system which results in improved environmental outcomes com compared to conventional single-use models. For additional resource, Sustainable Packaging Coalition has an excellent report out called the Guidance for Reusable Packaging. I'd encourage you to check it out if this is something you're interested in, in learning more in. Zach, before you get too much further, do you want to go back a couple of slides to the, uh, the, the bar graph? Yeah, we had a question here. So, uh, so if reusable, a glass, steel, or aluminum vessel, LCA would improve. Is that correct? Um, does do you, do you understand what they're asking there? Yeah. Yes. Not necessarily because this does not include the cost to sanitize, the transport to get it back from the point that it's used, um, and the point that you know you're sanitizing and refilling it. So this this is a single use model that it's looking at. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, if you had a glass bottle and perhaps you get a thousand turns out of that, then it could make sense. And that's where you have to look at things holistically as a system and consider things like transport in between steps. And it's not just simply the uh, carbon footprint that goes into making a package. It's everything that that package does during its, its useful life. Yeah. Good, qu great question. Yeah, absolutely. So next on the waste hierarchy is recycling. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about recycling since shifting to a circular economy will require increasing recycling and the use of recycled content in packaging. Look, we've all read stories or heard about how recycling is broken and is a fraud. I recently last week visited a recycling center near me, and I can tell you that's it's not true. I mean, the truth is recycling is happening everywhere, but recycling is hard, and these pictures really tell that story. Um, that that giant mass of mixed goods on the left is how the material recovery facility, known as a MRF, receives the recyclable waste from the community. You can see how everything is just mingled together. The waste is then sorted into like items, like a, a PET bottle, in a multi-step separation process. And that process is either manual, as in this case, you can see uh, in that center picture there, the gentleman on the line is picking out a particular item, or uh, by automation in, in some MRFs, or usually it's a combination of the two. And the final product at a MRF is a bale, which is sold to a reclaimer for reprocessing into recycled content. And that finished bale, that's a mixed paper bale there, is shown on the right-hand screen of, uh, of the picture there. I'd like to thank the Outagamie County uh, Recycling Center for hosting us. And if you, I could just say, if you ever get a chance to go tour MRV, it's totally worth the time. And it really highlights how, how difficult and the challenges that are there for recyclers, what they face every day. So recycling is not broken, 
but system-wide improvements need to be made in order for it to th truly thrive. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimate, estimates that only 14% of plastic packaging gets recycled globally. And look, we can and we should do better as an industry. Uh, I hear people say all the time that we just need people to recycle more. Yeah, sure, consumer behavior is a big part of it, but only 52% of Americans have access to curbside recycling programs. Those are the programs that come to pick up your recycling as they would do with your trash. The other 48% have no services, recycling services, or must take their recyclables to a drop-off location. So one reason why access to re recycling is so low is because recycling programs are very costly to operate. Most people are under the impression that the local governments make a profit from the materials collected in recycling, but that's simply not the case. Those revenues usually just offset a portion of the costs. I'm sure you've heard the terms recyclable and recycled before. These terms are easy to confuse and commonly get intertwined. So let's spend a second defining them before we move forward. Recyclable refers to an item that can be collected and reprocessed into a new item. There are some requirements that must be met to claim a package as recyclable, but we're gonna to get to that in the next few slides. On the other hand, recycled content is the material derived from the recycled item. The content is used to make new items. So if the material is derived from items collected after consumer use, the material can be claimed as post-consumer recycled content or PCR. When claiming recyclability or for a packaging format, we must consider all four pillars of the practice of recycling. Collection, sortation, reprocessing, and end markets. So using the Association of Plastic Recyclers definition of recyclable, which reflects the Federal Trade Commission Green Guides criteria, 60% of consumers must have access to areas that collect the item, the item must be sortable with like materials into bales. It must be reprocessed cost effectively in a, in a standard recycling process. And at the end of the day, it has to have end market value. So someone has to want to buy it. In that frame of mind, let's look at the challenges packaging faces in these four areas. Zach, we have a couple of other questions. Do you want to hit on them now or do you want to wait towards the end? You know, let's hold, let's hold them until the end. Okay, perfect. Yep. So collection. A 60% access threshold is needed to achieve widely recyclable status. That means that 60% uh, of US residents, if you want to claim a water bottle is recyclable, 60% of residents must have access to a system where they can recycle that in their area. Now, some states have elevated thresholds for universal recyclability cl claims. Simply put, not enough people have access to recycling programs that accept all types of packaging formats and materials. Bottles are commonly accepted in most programs, but trays and tubs are not always, even if they are the same material. So if a format and material falls below the 60% threshold needed to claim an item is widely recyclable, a check locally qualified recycling claim can be deployed by a brand using SPC's How to Recycle Label program. We'll talk a little bit more about that program later, but you can see an example of that qualified claim there with the check lo locally label. It's no surprise that America's recycling infrastructure needs modernization. And look, this, this is not a criticism of material recovery facility operators or recyclers. The fact is the rapid evolution of packaging formats has placed significant burdens on our MRFs and on our recyclers. Packaging shapes, labels, adhesive, and ink choices, material selection can impact the ability to sort and reprocess. In order to improve sortation efficiency and yield, 
investments are needed in state-of-the-art sortation technology like robots, uh, near-infrared sorters, and artificial intelligence. The next pillar we're going to discuss is reprocessing. A recyclable item must be able to be processed in a typical recycling system, recycling system in a cost-effective manner. It is very common for beverage containers, like the water bottle shown, to be reprocessed into recycled content for use in food contact applications, like beverage containers or thermoforms. It is also common for packaging items to be recyclable, recycled into durable goods. As an example, polyethylene plastic bags can be converted into polymer-based lumber and durable outdoor furniture. I'll be honest, there's a very active debate in the packaging industry right now or sustainability community about whether true circularity, like bottle to bottle recycling, should be our mission or should we focus on what is truly best for the environment uh, for each commodity and material type. Finally, end markets, the last pillar. So a strong end market for post-consumer recycled content can create the necessary incentives for MRFs to sort and recyclers to process packaging. It is difficult to justify the equipment investments needed to capture all packaging formats without a stable mature market for those formats. We are currently forcing, facing some economic headwinds that threaten to slow the adoption of all PCR types. These headwinds include the cost of using virgin materials, especially in plastics, and uh, the relatively low cost to landfill waste. So those are some headwinds we faced as an industry, face as an industry. By that, at this point in the, in the presentation, you may be wondering why using recycled content and packaging is so important. So I thought I'd, I'd uh, highlight some of the, the key benefits here Simply put, introducing PCR into packaging keeps valuable material out of our landfills so it can recirculate in our economy. And that's true no matter what the, the material type is, plastic, paper, fiber, glass, aluminum. The demand for PCR fuels the economic incentives our recycling industry needs to operate. Uh, plus, outside of the economic benefits, using PCR significantly lowers the carbon footprint of a package and reduces the use of virgin materials. Brands are discovering that using PCR can enhance brand equity with sustainability-minded consumers. So we should be using as much PCR and packaging as we possibly can. Before we move on um, from, from recycling, let's talk about take back programs or closed loop recycling. These can be a creative option to recycle an item when traditional recycling collection systems are, aren't available. The one example that is becoming more common uh, in closed loop recycling is the recycling of plastic trays used in industrial assembly processes. So these trays are sometimes called work in process or whip trays. You may be familiar with them. An example take back program is illustrated on this slide. It might look something like this, although they tend to be uh, very unique from case to case. The trays are collected after they are used in that whatever that industrial process is. And in this case, it's a pharmaceutical device that is uh, assembled and, and filled at a, a pharmaceutical company. Um, after the tray is done, they are shipped to a local recycler where they any any potential contaminants like uh, different types of materials are, are sorted out. Um, and then what's remaining is ground into usable flake. The flake is then shipped back to the original tray manufacturer for reuse into production of new trays. So, you know, if you're working on a, an application or a project that, you know, perhaps it, it would not be easy to collect from a curbside recycling program and you're sending valuable material either to waste streams or a landfill or maybe a, a lower value recycling, um, this is something to mention to your suppliers to see if it would be a, a good fit for those types of applications. 
So this is a, a bit of a, a rabbit hole, but you may have heard the terms chemical recycling or advanced recycling and wondered what this means. I mean, we could spend we could spend all hour talking about this topic. It's it's really exciting. It's really unique. Uh, but I'm not I'm not going to get into the weeds. But just so you know that advanced recycling, it's really a suite uh, of novel recycling techniques intended to complement mechanical recycling by focus on on hard to recycle materials. Now there are many different types of advanced recycling methods, but they typically get characterized into three main buckets as shown on this slide. One being purification, then there's depolymerization and conversion. So each type breaks the polymer down to a precursor or purifies out impurities like color and, to, and additives. Um, you know, one example is it's possible to recycle used carpet into PET to make new water bottles using um, depolymerization techniques. So in a nutshell, I'm, I'm very excited to see the role that advanced recycling plays in shifting to a more circular economy for packaging. Um, it's very hard to not be encouraged by the level of investment and potential impact. Um, so I would say there is definitely cause for cautious optimism. Uh, if you're if you're interested in learning more, the closed loop partners re report sourced on this slide really is, has become the definitive guide for where the technology is today and what role it's expected to play in the future. Um, so I I definitely encourage you to check it out. Again, it's closed loop partners transitioning to a circular system for plastics. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention biodegradable or compostable packaging. Um, this technology, I wouldn't say it fits neatly into the waste hier hierarchy, but merits discussion. Kind of like advanced recycling, there are many different technologies that kind of get rolled into one and come into play here. They, they all tend to get lumped together. And this creates confusion. Um, just about any polymer can be made from a bio-based source. So I'm gonna go back to my favorite example, the water bottle. Uh, that polymer, the PET, the plastic, that could be made from fossil fuel or it can be made from a bio-based source like sugar cane. However, that doesn't mean that that water bottle is biodegradable or compostable. Now, some bio-based polymers, like you may have heard of PLA uh, or PHA, are either com compostable or biodegradable. And this chart here from the Sustainable Packaging Coalition kind of shows the difference between the two. So when we say compostable, what does it mean? When we say biodegradable, what does that mean? Um, I can talk to the primary hurdle for compostable or biodegradable packaging is lack of infrastructure needed to compost packaging. And you know, community-based infrastructure for composting is growing rapidly, there's no doubt about it. However, only about 10% of Americans have access to these types of programs. And many of these programs only accept organics, so they don't currently take packaging items. Um, I just suggest if you are considering a bio-based or compostable package uh, for your applications, just consider all these important aspects. And um, the report highlighted here on the slide is a really great place to start, again, from the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. All right, so phasing into the final segment of this presentation, um, let, hey, let's be candid. As packaging professionals seeking to develop more circular packaging, there's a lot outside of our control, and it can certainly be frustrating at times. Um, I'm going to focus here on some positives. Solutions are available today using readily available technology and well-established best practices. So this final segment is going to focus on ways packaging creators, brands, and other key stakeholders can maximize their impact. We talked a lot about PCR earlier in the presentation and how um, using PCR in our packaging provides those economic incentives for our recycling industry to work and fuels investment and making those system-wide improvements that we need to make so that re recycling can thrive. So my first suggestion, my first challenge is to publicly pledge to increase the use of PCR in your packaging, whether it's plastic, glass, aluminum, whatever the substrate, 
Uh, measure your progress. Be transparent. Most importantly, hold yourself accountable. So speaking as a packaging converter, these commitments help us project the needs of our customers and guide strategic decision-making, easy for me to say, including capital planning. So designing packaging for recovery, and again, this goes back into some upstream things we can control as a packaging designer to optimize the, the chances that our package, the packaging we put out in the world will be recycled. Designing truly recyclable packaging is hard, and we can't forget that the primary job of a package is to preserve and protect its contents. Uh, in terms of plastics, the APR design guide can simplify the process and is available for free on their website. Um, you use features that are deemed preferable to recycling and avoid features detrimental to recycling whenever possible. I believe there are other guides out there for, for other materials as well. Just whatever you do, make sure that your, your organization's packaging designers are fluent with these principles and ingrain them into your packaging development process. So designing for, for PCR, and, and when, you, when you add PCR to a package, it can have trade-offs, especially if you're, if you're considering a, a plastic PCR that's recovered from a mixed waste stream. Um, you know, engage with internal groups, understand what is truly critical to quality and brand equity so that specifications can be opened up and are suitable for PCR variability. You can see some examples in this picture. You notice a little bit more yellowing, a little bit more graying. Um, that's definitely reflective of using 100% post-consumer recycled content to make um, these types of package. Um, also PCR, kind of depending on where the market is, often results in increased cost these are the, the premium of PCR compared to Virgin. That's not always the case, but um, more often than not, that's what we see. So work with your suppliers to identify ways to reduce costs, like light weighting, um, so that you can essentially offset the effect of adding PCR to your packaging. Consumers want to purchase products from companies that are sustainable. This is becoming ever more important as the per purchasing power of younger generations continues to grow. So don't be shy about sharing your sustainability story. Uh, communicate your product sustainability benefits to quench this consumer demand. In fact, I was just looking at something the other day. The Hellman's brand has done an excellent job of this. If you, if you visit their website, you can see we are committed to PCR in giant letters and they kind of detail like what that means and the benefit that it provides to their consumers. I think collectively as, as an industry, whether we're a brand or a packaging converter or somewhere else in the value chain, you know, we need to work together to educate consumers. Consumers, overwhelmingly express a desire to recycle, um, but confusion along with the inequitable access issue we discussed previously is a primary reason why they don't. Um, you know, one potential solution for this is the how to recycle label from the Sustainable Packaging Coalition provides explicit directions on how to recycle a package. Uh, deploy this label to avoid confusion and increase consumer confidence in recycling. Also, the Recycling Partnership has recently launched a, a tool on their website where anyone can enter in their location, they can enter in the product that they want to recycle, and their chatbot will tell the person on the spot whether that item is recyclable in that area. So you can check that out at the Recycling Partnership website. Really interesting tool, could be very powerful moving forward. Again, clearing up confusion and uh, making sure that that's not a reason why people don't recycle in the future. So get involved locally is my, my next suggestion. Um, recycling is very decentralized and capabilities vary significantly from community to community. I visited several MRFs and recyclers over the past several years, and they, they all do something unique. There's always something different. 
Um, I suggest reach out to your local MRF in your area and understand what those unique capabilities are. Um, determine how your particular packaging flows through their process, understand where they receive it, how it's sorted, um, and then where where does it go? Like what end markets do your, does your package go into if it is captured and, and finds its way into a bale? Identify those true end of life outcomes for your package. Uh, also understand what their gaps and pain points are and, and bring that information back to your internal stakeholders for improvement opportunities. I think these relationships, these boots on the ground type activities are what's gonna help us get to that next step uh, with where our recycling system needs to go for a circular economy. So value chain or supply chain engagement. Work with uh, stakeholders at all levels of the packaging value chain. Discover their challenges and areas where help is needed. Share your needs in areas that they can help. And, and most importantly, challenge them. So as a, as a packaging converter, it is so helpful to understand if we're working with a brand on a new package, to understand what are your organizational goals around sustainability? Uh, where, where are your pain points and where do you need help? How do we fit? And just have those very open, candid, collaborative conversations. That's what's gonna help push things through to the next level. So look, increasing the sustainability and circularity of all packaging types it's going to require an intense, unprecedented level of collaboration. Um, these are challenges we face. That they're too steep to face alone. We have to face them together as an industry. Um, consider joining industry groups focused on improving recycling. And most importantly, find your unique contribution. Just, don't just join the, uh, the, the organization so that you can put it on, on a slide and say, we're part of this organization truly contribute and find um, where you can where you can offer up um, assistance and help. So look, we have to work together to make the progress that is rightfully expected of us. And with that, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, I, I believe we'll be sharing the presentation um, with everyone that's attended. You'll notice at the end, I've included some slides that have a, a glossary of terms, terms I may have used today or you've heard in relation to sustainability. Uh, look, feel free to reach out to me. My email, LinkedIn, and phone is here. Um, hopefully, you'll receive a copy of the presentation soon. So with that, Jeremy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Are there any questions that we can go through? Yeah, absolutely. we got a couple of good questions right off the bat here. So the first one we'll start with is um, going back to the single stream recycling. Um, what is the impact of that of a single stream recycling system? Um, will you suspect more participation um, and would you get more contamination because of it? Yeah, that bingo. So we do have pre predominantly single stream recycling here in the United States. So what that means is that when we say single stream, think of yourself as at home as a consumer in the same bin, you're putting paper, you're putting plastic, you're putting glass, everything goes into that same bin and then somebody collects it and uh, they take it to a material recovery facility where it's all sorted out. So that single stream has benefits and it has trade-offs and globally um, there are other areas that have dual stream, so you might have all glass in one container and everything else in another, or you know that kind of depends on what the capabilities are of that particular region. But long story short, the, the primary benefit of single stream is it, it's supposed to increase participation. It's supposed to remo remove the burden from the consumer, so we don't have to worry about sorting things at home. We just dump them all into our bin and we take it out to the curb. Uh, but what it does is it shifts the burden from the consumer um, to the recycler and to everyone else involved in that value chain. So you saw that picture I had up there. Everything arrives at the material material recovery facility, the MRF, basically in one big commingled lump. They literally take this dump truck, they use a, a, a lift, and they take all this commingled, essentially it's 
trash at that point and put it into their sorting process. So it shifts the burden. And when you think about all of the different, not just material types, but all the different packaging shapes and formats, uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible when you think about having to sort all that stuff manually, which is why we're seeing a movement and we're seeing traction with the proliferation of automation and really cool technology around um, um, automated systems and AI, like cameras that can basically look at a package and based on its shape, know, oh, okay, that's a high density polyethylene jug. I'm gonna put it over here. Um, so technology is rapidly advancing to kind of compensate for a lot of that, but it is costly, it takes time, and those are all things that we need to support as an industry. So, kind of a rambling answer, but I hope that, that covered it. That was a great question and a great response. Yeah. Another really good question right away. Um, do you know if recycled materials from the U.S. MRFs get used in the U.S. or do they get sent overseas? Um, are there challenges with using recycled content? Some products like food and medical packaging can't yeah. really use a lot of recycled material. Oh yeah, no, no, bingo. I'm gonna start with that last one first. So yes, great example. So primary packaging for pharmaceutical products and sterile barrier packaging for medical devices. Uh, the FDA does not allow the use of uh, post-consumer recycled content in those packages. So that's definitely a headwind. And um, long story short, that's kind of where advanced recycling can come into play because those technologies can convert uh, essentially the waste back to its molecular building blocks uh, to be rebuilt back into new polymers. So yes, there are certainly restrictions. And also even within, even outside of medical and, and pharmaceutical, um, there's just certain niches of polymers where um, there's a, a, a mix or a mismatch in terms of supply and demand. Like polypropylene is a great example of that. A lot of the a lot of the food packaging that we make in plastics contains is made of polypropylene, like yogurt containers and things of that nature. Um, but if you want to buy a food grade application of recycled polypropylene, it's nearly non, non-existent. And that's because there's so many different types of polypropylene materials and types, and it all gets commingled and mixed together in a single stream, that it becomes very challenging to uh, sort out a food grade only source. So yeah, I mean, within each material type, there are these kind of unique things that we need to work through and address. And it's why we have uh, organizations like the Recycling Partnership with plastics, uh, for the, with their coalitions for polypropylene and now PET and films, like really taking a deep dive, pulling together the key stakeholders for each of these kind of challenging areas and materials to figure out how do we make these system-wide improvements that we need to make to uh, advance the, the ball. So the, the, the first question, the first part of that question, Jeremy, did I cover it? Yeah, let me just go back to <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And and if Zach missed on anything, feel free to submit another question that oh, yeah. clarifies anything me. you might have missed. But um LinkedIn. Yep. Yeah, I think that leads into another really good question. So do you have any tips for harmonizing packaging designs to meet requirements between different states and countries? You know, because you have states like California that are gonna be a lot more strict than than other <laughs> states and different places like Europe, you know, countries over oh. in Europe are gonna be a lot different than the states. So Yes, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I think everyone's trying to figure that out because like like the question refers to, uh, there's just different sets of expectations and unfortunately, oftentimes they conflict. So in order to comply with something in California, maybe you're conflicting with something in Oregon, just to pick a couple of examples. But yeah, it's difficult. I, I just think in that case, it's important to understand what the landscape is. Uh, understand where you could have conflicts and that's it's very real and then work with um, key stakeholders both within your organization and some of these other um, organizations like Ameripen they do a great job of being being the voice for the packaging industry and when, when things like that happen also I know from a plastic standpoint the Association of Plastics Recyclers they are 
like their design guide, one of, one of the main intentions was to start to harmonize at least here uh, in the United States for plastic packaging so that we're using these features that are preferable to recyclers and trying to pull together that collective knowledge of the industry. And I know from a European standpoint, Rusty Class also does a great job of that. So you can check out Rusty Class. I don't think they are just plastics. I think they do multiple materials. Um, and then from a film standpoint, CFLEX. So all of these organizations are working to standardize the best they can. But yeah, there are some instances where there, there are conflicts and um, those are just things we have to address on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, I think you just kind of, you hit on this a little bit, but do you have any recommendations of resources or skills that you should learn to be more involved within the packaging space? And you kind of just mentioned some organizations that would be great at the end of that answer, but is there anything else you would recommend in regards to that? Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you know, at a high level, there's some really good, so I, I, I definitely emphasize with this question because I'm not like formally trained in sustainability. I'm a mechanical engineer. I spent most of my career in product management, product development, and then did a stint in sales. So uh, I, I kind of fell into sustainability and I'm really glad I did. It's, you know, it's a passion of mine. I love what I do. I love working with our customers on to solve these complex issues. So um, I guess my first advice, if you're looking for something a little more formal, there, there are a lot of really good certificate programs that are out there um, you can search for. Um, some are intensive, some are not as intensive, but if you're looking to get that more formal education, a certificate program can be a great route. Um, and then I think the best way to learn is to find out who those key uh, subject matter experts are in your organizations, talk to them, find out what they're working on, uh, find out what your organization, what their goals are for sustainability, um, and see how you can get involved. And then externally, yeah, there, there are so many great organizations uh, focused on moving the needle forward. I'm going to go back to the slide, but kind of depending on what industry you're in or what your area of focus is, each of these uh, organizations takes a slightly different perspective and, and path, path at things. So I would say find, find some of these organizations, get involved, like typically they have working groups or committees that are open to membership. And, um, you know, just, just get involved. And I, I think one thing that's um, really interesting to me about sustainability is it's still a re relatively new topic and relatively new area. So if it's something that's interesting to you, it's rapidly evolving. It, you know, it's fairly, I don't want to say easy to catch up, but if you put in the time and the effort and it's something you're passionate about, there isn't a huge, like, barrier to, um, to, to get caught up. So. Yep. Yep, absolutely. We have a few more. So how can you quantify how much PCR is really in your package? Suppliers say zero to 10%, for example, but um, for plastic, how do you know it's not all virgin? Um, because PCR is sometimes not readily available. Yeah, fantastic question. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that the industry is putting more focus on this. I think it's a good thing. There are certification programs now. Um, APR has a program. Um, I, there are others. I'm blanking on the name. S, I think SCS Global may be either an auditor for them or have their own program. But essentially, they look at your supply chain and A, they certify that, yes, indeed, that that recycled material you have does indeed come from post-consumer sources. And then they, they look at your, your books and make sure that you're accounting for that appropriately and tracking that appropriately. So if that's something that you feel like is appropriate for your business and, um, you know, something you'd explore further, check it out at APR, their website. It's their PCR certification program. And I, I would say, too, working into specifications whenever you can. And just have those candid conversations. I would I would lay it out exactly like that. How do I know this? And and see what their response is. Fantastic questions today, Jeremy. Any anything else?
Yeah, absolutely. These are great questions, and we have a couple more. So, does the FDA allow industrial waste recycled content? Uh, that's a, a good question. I think it all depends on the source. So there isn't like a blanket authorization. So basically what happens is if you have a recycling process or a material, you have to go through their letter of non-object um, challenge testing, essentially. So the FDA won't say, yes, hey, yes, this material, this recycled material is suitable for use in, um, in uh, food grade applications. But what they do offer up is this letter of non-object, or commonly called an LNO, that basically says this process or material has been challenge tested, and uh, we do not object to the use in um, in these applications. So I think it all depends on the source and if that source has been through um, that type of process. Yep. Yep. And there's one more here. We might need some elaboration on, but I'll see if. Um, so, what is Walmart capable of by taking the plastic bags back to the store? I don't know. Do you know of any kind of plastic bag take back yeah, program that Walmart's that's, doing and what their intention is with yeah, it? Yeah. So, it's like a store collection site for bags is very common, and not just Walmart, but many of these stores are doing that. And they're also collecting, kind of unseen to the, the shopper, to the consumer, the back of the store films that are used. So, like all the shrink wrap that goes on the pallets of the products that they receive. Um, so a lot of that poly, it's, it's primarily polyethylene. Um, it'll, it'll go directly to a reclaimer, a recycler, and the vast, vast, vast majority of that goes into lumber. So I think um, Trex is one of the big players there. Um, lumber, durable goods is, a, uh, is an outlet for that type of material. Yep, perfect. Yeah, well, I think that answers all of the questions. And if anyone has any more questions, feel free to reach out to Zach. He's happy to help however he can. Um, like he said, we're going to be sending out the presentation, so you'll have his contact information. Outside of that, we appreciate you all taking time out of your day to, to stop by and learn some more about sustainability. It's a, it's a topic that's not going away in our industry, and it's going to continue to grow, even in industries like medical, where historically it hasn't been a huge concern. So. Um, like I said, reach out to me if you want to get more involved. And, uh, you know, historically, the Chicago chapter has been one of the stronger chapters, and we kind of want to restore it to what it used to be. So whatever you want to do, however you want to get involved, we're happy to have you guys, you know, come in and then bring this chapter back up where it was. Thanks for having me, everybody. Appreciate it. Feel free to reach out if I can help. Absolutely. Thanks, Zach, and thanks, everyone. Thank you.